early in beautiful California. My name is George Wallace. This is day four of Poets Building Bridges Triangulation Project. To kick us off, I'd like to introduce Don Krieger, who is uh, graciously hosting the, uh, the day's events, on Cultivating Voices, live streaming it, and also recording this for his YouTube series. He's also going to be a reader today, so he's doing a triple whammy for us uh, today's show. Uh, Don, welcome. Let's say, uh, tell us a little bit about Cultivating Voices. Okay. Uh, well, Cultivating Voices is a Facebook-based uh, reading series that's that's curated by Sandy and Known and Kim Ports Parsons. It runs once a week. It's been running since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, it's a good series, it has good poets and a lot of people come. Um, I hope you all will enjoy it. Um, for today's reading, I'm, I'm streaming it direct to Cultivating Voices, and then I'm gonna share it immediately. I'm gonna start that in just a moment to a, a bunch of other places on Facebook. So on the order of about 20,000 people on Facebook will have immediate access to the live video. And then we'll also, of course, put it up on uh, YouTube. It's, it's my privilege to be here. Thank you, everyone. Great. OK, so um, on behalf of the, uh, uh, the, the poets and musicians who are joining us today from various parts of the world, but especially a uh, block of Armenian diaspora, uh, various people from, uh, from, uh, from Italy, and uh, my friends here in New York, who I'll be introducing later in the show. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you who are with us on Zoom and those of you who are joining us by Facebook. So, like I said, this is day four of a six episode series called Poets Building. It's been going very well. And um, each day um, we get new surprises of who we have with us and what they present to us. I'm delighted to have. Uh, another chance to collaborate with Anja Stein, who's the, um, the compare for uh, for the uh, Italian group, and Lola Kundakchin, who is the uh, compare for the Armenian diaspora group. So welcome to all of you. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Anja, who is going to present uh, her group of people. Anja, please. Thank you very much, George, for putting together all these wonderful events, which are very important. We have to build bridges in times of war because this is the only thing we can do. We are all brothers and sisters, and this is uh, somehow the proof that you can go beyond uh, borders. So we will start with um, Viviana Fiorentino. She is a bilingual poet based in Belfast, originally from Italy where she's a lecturer in the Italian IIC Dublin and a facilitator at Quotidian Word of the Street. She published a novel and two poetry collections in Italy and um, her poems were supported by ACNI grants. This is very interesting because in Italy, nobody grant gives any money for <laughs> publishing, but in Ireland, you have this possibility. Some of her poems have been recorded for the Irish Poetry Reading Archive. Also, this is a thing I think we should copy in Italy because poets need an archive. If they die, they disappear. That's not fair. And she is a co-founder of three Irish poetry projects that are also very important. One is called Sky, You Are Too Big. The second is A Suitcase of Poetry. And the last is Letter with Wings. These are all international projects that involve lots of people uh, in all over the world. They are connecting projects. And I think maybe on Facebook, one or the other will have come across these titles. Viviana is on the editorial board of the Le Ortique. It's a blog, an initiative that wants to rediscover forgotten woman artists. So this is also very important work she is doing. And she is board member of the Irish Pen. Viviana, the word to you. Thanks so much, Antje. 
Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, thanks, Anche. Thanks, George. I'm delighted to be here today. Um, I'm a poet based in Belfast, and um, um, I moved to Ireland a few years ago after having moved across Europe for many years. And because of my life experience with uh, traveling and moving to different countries and landscapes and the various languages I'm exposed to, I've always been in a situation of uh, sleeping and being in an in-between state. And this experience of uh, using different languages in my life has made me recognize that we are made of uh, multiple experiences and voices, they layer within ourselves and they express themselves in uh, different ways. Being bilingual is like cultivating a garden, a space in front of your house that connects home with the outside. And when I write, I'm in this garden where different geogra geographies and cultures, those from home and those from the street outside merge and flow. The first poem I'm going to read in English and then in Italian is Land. It's a reflection on migrating and I like the connection between body and land, the sense of belonging, the search for our land. And I'd like to dedicate this poem to all the refugees that at the moment are escaping wars in the world. Landing. Sky, you are too big. Persian blue, I cannot know you. Instead, I call on you, land. Give me a place to put my feet, a home for my uncertainty, a place to doubt, a place to live. In Italian, approdo. Cielo. Tu sei troppo grande. Blu di Persia, non ti conosco. Io ti chiamo terra, dammi un suolo per questi piedi, una casa alle mie incertezze, un rifugio per dubitare, un posto per vivere. The next poem is part of some poems that appeared in the anthology Writing Home, The New Irish Poets by Didalus Press and witness my experience as a volunteer in a migrant detention center in Northern Ireland and a Red Cross body project for welcoming refugees. I read again first in English and then in Italian. <clears throat> Between the teeth, we blather, idling, chittering, time passes like ice melting or something sweet dissolving in the mouth, yet thickening, thickening there between the teeth. I know the wind carries more than spores, chances, places to fall or settle and root in moss like chanterelles in Carrigan or sphagnum and others and yet others. There is a white light in you still grow from the heart of your sorrow seed, hesitant and latent, secret as a stone. There are a few words in Irish, some people who came across Ireland maybe recognize those few words in Italian now. <clears throat> Tra i denti. Io ti racconto e ti racconto. Così il tempo passa e ti piace perché poi c'è voglia anche di questo, di lasciarsi come squagliare del gelo, come qualcosa di dolce, rappreso lì tra i denti. Io lo so che il vento, le spore e altro e poi altro ancora trasporta, perché sono le possibilità di terre, altre e speranze come funghi tra muschi e sfagni e altro, altro ancora come quella luce che è bianca in te, che è venuta lei fuori dal seme, di quel dolore che avevi sepolto nel tuo cuore, fatto latente, occulto, come pietra. Uh, 
the last poem uh, I'd like to read today speaks of places and uh, geographies to which one arrives or departs from. From a biographical point of view, this poem goes back to when I arrived in Ireland some years ago. Names. When we arrived on the island, the land had the same color of the sky. So blue we thought we were standing on the ski on the, of the earth. On the road to the new house, wild herbs and a yellow flower with a name meaning the first, primula, Linnaeus call it, or the earliness of flowering, or the immediate blossoming after the disappearing of snow. In the garden, plants were waiting for the end of winter, pollens were embe embedded in the soil, a prehistory of death, recycling new beginnings, a bulb in the clothes had a raindrop on its fold of the green stem, an immortal trace made mortal by light. We too adapted to dying back and regrowing the next season. We got new names and a raindrop folded in the mind, a memory keeper in the planet archive, archive the ultimate cell beyond names, a survivor embryo moving between worlds. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Liviana, for this very, very nice poems. So now we have Sabrina Di Cagno of the Little Museum of Poetry from Piacenza in Italy, who will greet us and read us an, a poem. Sabrina. Thank you. Thank you, Antje. Oh, hello, everybody. I'm speaking to you today as a director, co-director of Piccolo Museo della Poesia, Chiesa di San Cristoforo, Little Museum of Poetry, Church of San Christopher, Piacenza, Italy, the only one of its kind. Uh, the museum welcome the exquisite initiative uh, triangulation project uh, conceived by George Wallace in six days, full days, intense, and uh, gathering uh, poets and musicians all around the world, fantastic, and especially, which is today also passing through Piacenza, <laughs> uh, Italy, Armenia, and of course, the US. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really honored and delighted to be with all of you today. Building bridges, building lasting bridges is no easy feat. George has long experience in this. Our world, which is lurching more and more dangerously toward war, is well aware of this. The spirit of these beautiful poetry meetings is the encounter itself to get to know each other, the mutual listening, the sharing. All these make it possible to build stable bridges among us, able to overcome distances, pandemics, differences, and why not even fear of belonging to a world irremediably in conflict. I have long wondered what to say today as poet and uh, director of the Poetry Museum, what needs to be said these days. It seems to me that there is only one possible answer, to work for peace. I hope for and I believe in an effective and timely international peace negotiation that will end the violence between Russia and Ukraine. I believe that poetry is now called upon to make its voice louder. Poetry is a compass to navigate this stormy sea, to bring about the ever-present possibility of peaceful encounters in the creativity of the world. So, <laughs> Dear poets, dear musicians, friends who are following us, friends of friends, families, dreamers, please let's stand up for peace. We crave peace. We need peace, not only for ourselves, human beings, but also for our fellow creatures with feathers, fur, and leaves. 
They are also asking with all their heart and common sense for peace. So thank you very much, George. Thank you all for building bridges. What we are all doing now is very, very important. I will read now a very short poem before in English. In the lap of vertigo, sorry, in the lap of vertigo, the brush stroke is divine. The top is deep, the dome is a well, the air grainy like a rat. Stars in stars shine, cause I look from afar like the night and heart flutters hanging from balcony without roof. Does a rose recognize the taste of water? Full of intent be our blooming above and below us. Thank you everybody, thank you very much. Non lo leggi anche in italiano? Ah, sure, you're right. I forgot it. <laughs> Italian, sorry. <laughs> in grembo alla vertigine si addivina il tratto. L'alto è profondo. La cupola è pozzo. L'aria sgranata come un relitto. Stelle nelle stelle brillano. Perché lontano uno sguardo le accende. E il cuore fluttua. Appeso ad un balcone senza radici. Conosce la rosa e il sapore dell'acqua. Pieno di intenzione sia il nostro fiorire sopra e sotto di noi. Grazie. Grazie Sabrina, grazie. Now we want to introduce to you Mauro Ferrari. He has published many poetry collections, but also short stories and essays. And he is the editor in chief of Punto a Capo edition in Italy. Uh, this edition edited many anthologies which give a panorama of the contemporary uh, poetry in Italy, among which Il Fiore della Poesia Italiana, or Dove va la poesia, where does poetry go? He founded and directed also the literary magazine La Clesidra and published poetry poems, essays, translations from contemporary English poets. He is a member of the literary prize Guido Gozzano, and he is the cultural director of the Poetry Biennale of Alexandria, which now will enlarge and include also the little museum of poetry in Piacenza and the House of Poetry in Como. And I'm sure you will come across the events that we are going to create because uh, this is a big connection we do in Italy and we want to put it on the international platforms too. So Mauro, please read us your poems. Devis, um, aprire il microfono. Non ti si sente, devi eh, schiacciare sul microfono. Mauro? Mauro, sì, devi lì sotto, a fianco del video c'è un microfono, devi schiacciare, ecco. That's why, yeah, I couldn't say it. So, thank you very much. Um, this time I've chosen to go back to basics, what life is, what man is, what we are. And uh, I'm going to read, to simply read three poems. The first in English, the first one, Hebrides and not only. With the wind and the rain keep hammering second after second, the land is a castaway, surviving hurricanes, the rock a barren black hue, mercilessly fighting exhausted green, step by step. Where between us in the horizon, it's only barbed wire, artillery craters in a boggy no man's land. There, the brag of a flower reveals its yellow, arrogantly promising yourself eons of immortality, beaten down on a few brief days, 
by the quiet theory of regards. Italian. Dove il vento e la pioggia martellano istante su istante. La terra è un, un naufrago no? sopravvissuto agli uragani, la roccia un nereggiare sterile che implacabile combatte verdi affaticati passo su passo. Dove fra noi e l'orizzonte è filo spinato, voragini d'artiglieria in una terra di nessuno, acquitrinosa. È lì che lo squillare di un fiore giallo si rivela promettendosi borioso eoni di immortalità, percosso nei suoi pochi giorni dalla furia quieta dei suoi dei. The counterpart of the struggle for life is the vanity, the vanity of human wishes, the vanity of ourselves, of this stupid flower. The second poem, Mountain Pastures, Moreans, But observe the terminal moraine to appreciate Shiva's slow, steady job, the ice crumbling, the wind and the rain eroding minute upon minute, while the moss affixes its seal on unintelligible agreements and the millennia turn to dust in a silent glory. Meanwhile, the grass is pressing in the cracks, creating a bearable world, and the humble gentian heroically rolling the dice, dares to shout her name to the void among unconcerned steps and the calling from a distant flight. Ma alpeggi morene il titolo, ma osserva la morena terminale per apprezzare il lento, metodico lavoro di Shiva il ghiaccio che sgretola, il vento e la pioggia che rodono istante su istante mentre il muschio appone il sigillo su contratti incomprensibili e millenni nella gloria del silenzio vanno in polvere. Intanto l'erba cresce negli interstizi creando un mondo sopportabile e l'umile genziana si azzarda con un eroico lancio di dadi a urlare il proprio nome al vuoto, tra passi incuranti e il gracchiare di un volo lontano. And the last thing I'm going to read. The second part of this poem, which in fact is composed of five different parts. In the cold summer sun, in the hammering wind, butterflies clinging to life and groundhogs on the alert, a methodical spinning masters the bewildered kingdom a celebration for the mages and everything that cries out life, we want life. Be merciful if we tremble and moan. And this is the summer, the truth from the horror. Al freddo sole estivo, nel vento che martella farfalle aggrappate alla vita e marmotte allerta, un volteggiare metodico domina il proprio regno sgomento, tempo festivo per i moscerini e tutto quanto grida vita, vogliamo vita, pietà di noi frementi e piangenti. E questa è l'estate, la tregua dall'orrore. Thank you very much, Angela. Thank you very night. much, Grazie. Mauro Ferrari, Ciao. for these very nice poems. And thank you for being with us. It's the first time on an international platform with us. I am very happy. I'm honored. Got to knew you. Very nice. So before we go to the music part, I would like to read one poem, uh, which is uh, was a subject of the moment uh, regarding the war in Europe, in Ukraine, which is uh, we are in Europe, we are all very, very preoccupied because uh, this can really go into a, a third world war. And I mean, we are here happily together and seeing us united you from different places you sometimes somehow feel kind of sister and brotherhood but in reality also the ukrainian and the russians this is a war of brothers because they have a common history which lasted until the breakdown of the wall and uh, started a long time back so uh, after this uh, at the breakdown of the wall the border between NATO and Warsaw Pact was 
two, so, uh, 800 miles more to the west. So this things changed everything. Now, so my poem goes about this. That old wall in Berlin, impossible to climb over, did not collapse. They sold it piece by piece. Concrete slabs demolished, exhibited as trophies in museums, while the fragments, bloody gadgets, are dispersed throughout the world and multiply in a fragrant war pandemic. Thinking, reasoning, critical spirit overtaken by primordial instinct. And still, we all just want peace, the good ones and the bad ones, set one against the others like two repellent magnets. Peace, a word thrown to the ground, turned upside down, twisted, accumulated, pleading, suffering, raped for years, eaten away by termites. Only an empty shell remains. But still, we just want peace. Thank you. So now we go to the musical part and we start with Oscar Brontesi. He is in Fuerteventura. And if you uh, unmute your mic, Oscar, so you give us a little, little taste of your Okay. Loose introduction, and then we go back to Milan. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Go on. Yeah. Uh, just a minute. Okay. Maybe you will recognize it. I can't see myself, but doesn't matter. You see me. We go to Milan and continue with the blues. Are you ready, Milan? Uh, more or less. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it seems a little bit strange in the middle of the poetry reading, but um, I'm here with uh, Daniele Mottadelli, Simone Donizelli, che fanno la musica, anzi, eh, insieme a Oscar. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I forgot. I'm, uh, I'm here with. Um, the two musicians with Daniele Mottadelli and with uh, Simone Donizelli. And uh, it's a little bit strange to be doing the music, but that's what we do. I write poems and independently of songs. And um, they, together with Oscar Brontesi, who make up a group called um, First Principle or a principio attivo. Uh, we do, I write the poem and then we put it to music because I am a singer. And um, so I enjoy uh, mixing the music with the words. Uh, talking about war, I want to say, unfortunately, every war reminds you of another war. 
and uh, the poems uh, I'm reading, a, a couple of them, the first one, Soft Summer, is about forgetting nature and more important things. Even when we talk about peace, uh, we have to think about what, what should we be doing instead of making war. This is called Soft Summer. It was a soft summer sand. And the moon sometimes came out at night begging for attention. The seasons met unnoticed. We rushed through sunsets and wandered through the dark, pondering small meanings, breaking cycles, losing the taste of time. It was a soft summer sad, and the moon sometimes came out at night begging for our attention. The seasons met unnoticed. We rushed through sunsets and wandered through the dark, pondering small meanings, breaking cycles, losing the taste. next uh, poem uh, is called, it's in the same kind of sense, it's called Five Minutes for the Moon. And since I'm, uh, I usually sing blues and jazz, um, we put this in a, in a blues context, or they did, and I improvise around it. This is called Five Minutes for the Moon. I have another appointment. Just a glance, I've got to go. Five minutes to reflect. Where am I in the night sky? Perfectly placed, giving off some light, lasting through time. The moon waits gently for my next brief glance. I jump in my car and move small distances through eternity. The moon fills my mind. Five minutes for the moon. Five minutes. For the moon, I got to go. I have another appointment. Five minutes for the moon, uh, just a glance. I got to go. Five minutes to reflect. Five minutes. Where am I in the night sky? Perfectly placed. Do I give off some light? Five minutes. I gotta go. Uh, just a glance. Five minutes. Only five minutes for the moon. But the moon, the moon waits gently. For my next brief glance, but I only got five minutes. Five minutes for the moon. 
so I, I jump in my car. Yeah, I jump in my car. And I just move small distances through eternity. I move small distance through eternity. I got five minutes. But the moon fills my mind. It was only five minutes. Five minutes for the moon. And uh, five minutes. <laughs> the last poem is uh, a memory. It's about uh, New Orleans. Uh, it's called New Orleans 205, 2005. And it's about what happened in New Orleans when Katrina came, the big storm. Uh, but on another basis, it's about uh, people who are never shamed and people who never take the blame for injustices. The, the blues ripped off her Sunday clothes and stood there nude in the water with all those slave scars showing when the storm blew into New Orleans. Old Uncle Sam took Dixie by the hand and told her not to look while dead bodies and history books floated on the water when the storm blew into New Orleans. But the blues kept on singing a song, sugar cane song, plantation song, a riverboat song, railroad song, prison, 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 a prison song, song about cotton and the Ku Klux Klan while old Uncle Sam took Dixie uh, by the hand and told her not to look I uh, told her not to look while the soldiers kept pointing their guns and said, go back to the house of the rising sun or get out of town. Get out of town. Or get out of town. Get out of town. Get dressed in stars and stripes to hide the rope marks around your neck or get out of town get out of town go get out of town get out of town but the blues stood nude in the water and she kept on singing her songs and she watched Uncle Sam hold Scarlet by the hand and she wondered she wondered if they'd ever understand and she wondered if they ever felt ashamed, and she wondered if they'd ever 
Oh, when the storm blew into New Orleans, when the storm blew into New Orleans, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Betty Gilmore, thank you very thank much. You. I'm so glad Betty Gilmore, Daniele thank Montadelli, you. Simone Doninselli, and Oscar Brontesi. So uh, Simone, now I hand over to Lola Kondantinian from Armenia. Actually, no, I have to introduce her, Anja. So I'll turn it over to her. Thank you. Once more, a round of applause for all our guests from Italy, led by Anja Stein. Anja, of course, is a native of Germany, resides in Italy, poet, a visual artist, video producer. She's been integrating poetry and art installations of poetic artistic performances since the 90s. And really, she's a fixture on the international landscape and in, uh, in Zoom poetry, but done many, many events. She's uh, part of the International Collective Poetry is My Passion. And most recently curated Rucksack, a global poetry patchwork art installation project. It was shown at the Il Piccolo Museo della Poesia Chiesa di San Cristoforo in Piacenza, Italy. We have with us um, today Sabrina Di Canio from there. So once more, round of applause for all of our Italian friends. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks, much. <laughs> I will turn this now immediately over to Lola Kundakchin, Armenian poet, lived in New York City since the 70s. For over 25 years, she's organized evenings dedicated to the Dead Armenian Poet Society, and to, since 2006 has produced and edited texts and audios and translated for the multilingual Armenian Poetry Project. You've been very generous to me in introducing me to the many programs that she's involved in here in New York City and uh, her reach is international as well. Please welcome Lola Kundakchian and the Armenian Diaspora Group. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I've known uh, George a mere seven years, but always bumping to him, read together. We read at the centennial of the Armenian Genocide. And the purpose of this group is to let you know that although we have seen wars, we have seen genocides, we are here, we are connected with the world. We have a beautiful community in San Lazaro, Venezia. I'm proud to have visited that place twice. We have connections, even in Ukraine, we have a small community of about 400,000 Armenians. So we are part of this world and proud to be here to help build a bridge again. Our first reader is Nora Najarian, an award-winning poet and writer from Cyprus. She has won prizes or been commented it in international competitions, amongst others in the Live Canon International Poetry Competition 2020 and the Maslechia, am I pronouncing that correctly, Poetry Competition 2021. Her poetry and short stories have been included in numerous anthologies. Please help me welcome Nora to our forum. Thank you, Lola, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, being an Armenian Cypriot, that is to say an Armenian of the diaspora born on the divided island of Cyprus, I know what loss is. I know what it means to leave things behind. Um, 
I'm not, I decided not to read poems which have to do um, directly uh, with war and peace and bridges. Um, and because it snowed today in Nicosia, uh, something that very rarely happens. I'm going to begin um, with a couple of prose poems which have to do with mountains and snow. There are very few single mountains in the world. The earth's crust pushes up, forces itself out towards a cloudless sky, and they hold hands, the mountains, here an obstacle, there an adventure. Once on a plateau, warriors were bartering and selling milk of kindness on the eastern ridge of the highest of the mountains a waterfall fell and fell a solitary vulture soared and curated the dead frozen house all the robins turned white, even their lashes, if they have lashes. There is no border between white and white. Will we talk again once our voices have thawed? How cold I am in this bed and all the heating on. In that scene in Dr. Zhivago, she hates him for entering the frozen house. There's a candelabra she can't face because the flame is dead. Where will I go, she wonders. Where will I magically disappear to? Yesterday, my feet crunched all the way from the forest. Today, they will crunch all the way back. The bear's breath is warm, its voice large. It says, did you say goodbye to love? Keep your coat on a little longer. Ghost Mountain. It all happened a century ago or more and we lost a mountain. There is still snow but it is not young. There was a pristine white envelope with a letter for me from my father, dearest, explaining that the mountain had gone. We'd lost it to another country. Ditto the ark and the animals in it. Ditto Noah. There is no point in crying over melting snow, dearest. I thought, how can a mountain be lost or won? In an old atlas, my father shows me ghost countries, ghost cities. Then he mentions people. Your mother climbed the mountain in bare feet. She never reached the summit. Snow covered her tracks. We lost her. I want to tell you she was adventurous. You're old enough to know. She could have carried you on her back, dearest, but now it's too late. We only have each other and this illusion of living. Memories are losing their mind too, caught in a blizzard. I imagine my mother's soul has reached the abandoned ark. At such altitudes, snow becomes hallucination. I will write her a letter, dearest. Um, so we move on to um, the topic of mother tongue and other tongues, which many Armenians in the diaspora know um, what it means to have more than one mother tongue or more than one language to speak in. So this is a short poem called 
uninhibited in another language. Not swear words, but something I swear tastes of love. Watch your tongue, watch your tongue, romance. Oh, with barbs, I am modern when I speak uninhibited. I am passionate and terrible. My mother, silent, dumbfounded, thinks I've betrayed her, slapped her, run off with that other language. But no, I've returned. I can say love you, say love, tongue, mother, tongue, and all the bad girl slang. Shall I spit it out, spell it in bold beeps, or roll up my tongue till it hurts? My mother, fuck it, has so much to say these days. On Sunday, we go to church together. And I'm going to read um, the next poem in Armenian first and then in the English translation. Astherun la rutuna serdetsi. Astherun la rutuna serdetsi. Havara, sarov batvats yerkinka, zarerun urvakiza. Darinere iverne virvadze yashadanki, mitka sure, paitima. Zarmanali oren gefatana, yer gehosim ter dregibes totovem, ge vorosh hara pachtavor kisher nera, gerazem yer churiagentanin, iranusha puir hoda, ge vairi sumpak nera, gerevagaem voran bara, cerkus pernelov, idiarach no tesis kirk mojevas karelu, vorbidi yatsune ashara. I studied the silence of the stars. I studied the silence of the stars, the black icy skies, the skeletons of trees. For centuries, my mind was at work, sharp yet bitter and now old and strange. When I speak, I still lisp like a boy and on certain untroubled lucky nights when I dream of the unicorn its musky smell and wild hooves. I imagine that tomorrow will take my hand and teach me to write one more book which will astonish the world. Thank you. How inspiring, Nora Jan. Thank you very much. Shut, shut up, Riz. I'm happy to introduce next Arthur Kaizakian. This has been a very exciting month for Arthur. I am sure he'll tell us a little bit about it. Arthur is an LA based poet, editor, and teacher, and is the winner of the 2021 Black Lawrence Immigrant Writing Series, awarded for his collection, The Book of Redacted Paintings, which was also selected as a finalist for the 2021 Philip Levine Prize for Poetry. He serves with us, a few of us here on the poetry, uh, he's the poetry chair and serves with us on the International Armenian Literary Alliance. Welcome, Arthur. Hey, thank you, Lola. Um, hey, thank you so much. Uh, thank you everybody for, uh, for putting this event together. Thank you for reading today and for the beautiful music. Um, I, I know I, I know what war is like because that was my first experiences uh, of Earth when I was born in Iran. My parents uh, brought me to the United States. Uh, we sought refuge here. Um, my heart goes out to Ukraine and uh, I pray that the world puts an end to the rise of tyrants and their hunger for a global domination. Um, I'm gonna read three poems today. Uh, one is called, uh, this is called My Life in Declarative Sentences. I once sang to a group of troops dressed in pigeon gray. The stint in my voice tinted the windows green. In my personal assessment of the public, I measure the weight of a human soul by the lattice of tattoos on the skin. I don't like horror movies, 
At night, I stay up late. And the other day, my parents held an intervention about our birds living in a small cage. I like sliding doors, the smell of gasoline, and the snap crackle of a blue light when a moth dies. In another version of this moment, the moth teaches the blue light how to fly. When it's dark, I pretend to be the size of an ant. I want to remain astonished by the world and still hold my own with what I carry. Sometimes at the bank, I cut in line. Other times I throw money in a musician's open case. I once bought a pack of cigarettes for a homeless man and asked him about his life. His dog knew I was lying, the animal inside me, my deep caved eyes. I know algebra, piracy, the scent of my mother's neck. I take pride in weird facts like scientists who feed LSD to dandelions. My secret fetish is to disrupt the conversation between two bankers with a question about the value of paintings. What are you willing to die for? I was born in Iran. Now I am a sandbender living in America. I like to write letters to the state. They go like this. Dear rich people, you say leaving my house is an act of rebellion but it's only a matter of time. What is the body but a book of ours? Look at us. I know well the glamor of death hinged to a star. Our desire to be seen in this lifetime is all worth the risk if it means our bodies will collapse into one another in the dark. Uh, this next one is notes about undocumented confiscation. Panache in the general signature amidst the pile of bodies in the center of a blown out church. War notes unsettled in a red notebook tucked in his right back pocket. A diagram of a torso half eaten by an atomic shell. Smoke escaping his resonated pipe, the scent of small apples and ash a sour fume swirling in his mouth. At least the children of victors will sleep well in their new cities. At least they will keep a house with new paintings. Someone put the hex on my imagination where the last words of an artist hung from a rope. The body of the artist hanging in the air like the general's flamboyant signature. A child turned seven in a velvet suit the first time she witnessed a bee land on a sunflower moments before the guards burst through the door. Why do we choose to ignore what connects us was the question that stank the camp. The general's breath smelled of pistachio on the day he ordered the death of 107 artists small chunks of green meat in his teeth when he smiled. The child held her father's painting to the light and the word help surfaced to the canvas. A family sips tea from imported China across an enormous painting of a woman holding a yellow letter. The artist is unknown. I have lived as an empty theater hidden in the thorax of a fly where the last words of an artist hung from a rope. The auction was thick with the smell of cigar. Landowners raised hands and battled at the auction over the mysterious painting of a woman from an unnamed painter. How much for the yellow letter taunted a tall man in a white suit? The scratch on the bottom left side of the painting's frame was visible to the family sipping tea. The silence in the room about the scrape, the blade, the neck, the screams, the family before. The silence around the scratch and the way it was stripped from the wall. A century later, students do the little pieces of art in their notebooks the world will never see. 
while a historian lectures about the tragic death of 107 artists. At lunch, the historian pulls out a bag of pistachios from his book bag. It's time bender, and this will be the last one. Time takes the shape of a trusted border because it never turns back for you. Because betrayal in Farsi means khianat, translated back into English to sin. As in the desert is sun wrecked by the closest star. As in sweat can soak a telegram in a few seconds. At the firing squad, a letter tucked into your breast and the words sink inside you. Fool, who says you will need a letter when a decade of collapsing cities is written on your face? Since you were pulled under the scorch of the sun, time becomes the message you never read. Men on horses screaming, Chianet, Chianet, making an animal out of your resistance, confiscating your jacket of bombs, they pull you through the sand. Inside you now, dark holes of music trying to make way out of your mouth. Time turns the ink of your letters into songs you never sing. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Beautiful reading. Thank you for waking up early. You made this event even more special. All right, um, next, I'm going to read uh, three or four short pieces. The first one is entitled Awakening. There is a moment before you realize you are awake, a split second before the gentle whisper from the heater, before the need for a glass of water or the removal of the sweater the cold night made you wear. A moment when your mind is occupied by a picture, before gray cells remember tomorrow's agenda. Morning is quite far off, and the coffee is not already made. Pause before the regurgitation of last night's program, the excellent book turned into a bad film, the zests of the salad at dinner time, the fruity flavors of that red Zinfandel, before the body overrules the mind to get up or turn in bed and return to oblivion, end the interregnum, ignore it completely, or take pen to paper and record it gently. One of my favorite places in New York City is Cafe Reggio. It's over a hundred years old and it's in Greenwich Village or the village. Cafe Reggio. During visits to the West Village, I find myself stopping at this old haunt, a pilgrimage for the senses to a cafe unchanged since before the day I set foot in New York City. Towards the left, Patrons sit on iron back chairs and carved wooden benches, the drinks in on marble, marble topped tables. In the center, the WC's narrow door quoting Dante's Inferno, London, all hope ye who enter. On the walls, painted a medium brown, artworks hang. The ceiling and moldings bow slightly to classical music playing through invisible speakers. The original owners have passed on and the laws have made it smoke free, but little else has changed in this cafe since the 1930s. Neither the size of its menu nor the strength of its delicious coffees, the affordable pots of tea and sandwiches. Patrons still sit in dark corners wearing black, craving to be enveloped in smoke. Souls, the sound of an espresso brewing and steamed milk gurgling. In this cafe, one searches for the beats and hippies and the enchantment of bohemian life. And for my form of peace, I love writing about food and 
and the arts. And this is after a visit to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And it's entitled In Search of Rilke at the Metropolitan Museum of Art after a reading of Archaic Torso. A Sunday afternoon, the final lazy weekend of the summer, I escape to the cool, bright corridors of that art institution. I am in search of Apollo or Rilke. In the Hellenistic and Roman wing, I find Hermes, Eros, Heracles, headless torsos of young men and women, centaurs, athletes, and heroes. I turn around each statue and sepulcher, reading labels and descriptions. In desperation, I ask a guard, but she's clueless. I search for him in a cubiculum nocturnum, that is to say bedroom, in galleries, in the faces and camera lenses of tourists, finally finding him through old-fashioned help, the humble assistance of the information desk clerk. There are two Apollos here, one in worse shape than the other, one slightly taller, one still resting against a marble trunk, one with more genitals intact, more of the hip areas defined with both feet, perfect toes and toenails. The Japanese tourist photographs her friend grabbing, or is it covering the genitals? I hear the guard laughing heartily. Men, women and children walk by, few stop by to look at the headless torso, few read the description, few acknowledge that this was Apollo, this was the god of music and poetry, son of Zeus, father of Orpheus, one of the 12 Olympians, D.E. Consentis. Who cares for those lesser gods and heroes when Apollo is in the room? And still, I don't find Rilke, a man at least in some form or manner representing him, his essence, or a man who has read his work, a man aware of that dilemma called mid-career or life crisis. I wonder, if I tear a piece of paper, write in bold capital letters Rilke and hold it up, will someone stop and chat with me, sit and read with me that poem, ask me questions about it, maybe exchange something about himself, a revelation found through this encounter? If any answer to man's inner quest is to be found on earth, it could be at the feet of this statue or another work of art at this museum or another like it, in this city or another metropolis such as the many found on this or other continents. And yet his torso is still suffused with brilliance from inside, like a lamp in which his gaze, now turned to low, gleams in all its power. Thank you. Last but not least, our musician. The music of guitarist composer Aram Bajakian has been called a masterpiece, shape-shifting and sometimes delicate, sometimes punishing. He has toured extensively with Lou Reed, Madeleine Peyrou, John Zorn and Diana Kroll. Aram is currently a PhD candidate at the University of British Columbia. Thank you, Aram. Thank you everybody for all your poems today. They've been beautiful to listen to.
Thank you, everybody. One more time, a round of applause for all of our friends from the Armenian diaspora, the magic of Arambajaki and Lola Kundak. Kundakjian, who was a compare for this group. Nora Najarian, who joined us from Cyprus. Thank you, Nora. And Arthur Kazakian's fabulous poetry from Los Angeles. So we had a very nice spread there. Beautiful, beautiful time. We now turn to the third portion, third block of our triangulation today. We have three poets and uh, one musician. And I'll just say one more time to thank those of you who uh, appeared at previous sessions in this series who are here with us today. Those of you in upcoming sessions, including Merchant Adutta and, um, and Cindy Hockman, thank you both for coming. And those of you who've joined us again, just as audience, as to have a dedicated group of people. I know you appreciate what we're doing here, and I really appreciate uh, your support for it. Don Krieger, our first reader, joins us. A biomedical researcher's focus is the electric activity within the brain. He's the author of the Hybrid Collection Discovery, his 2020 Creative Nonfiction Foundation Science as Story Fellow. And as you know, he's also host of the YouTube channel that will host the Poets Building Bridges series and is doing so now. And he's streaming us live to 20,000 viewers across Facebook land. Please welcome Don Krieger. Thank you, George. And uh, thank you everyone for being here. And it's, it's a privilege to read in this company. I want to start with a poem from my uh, my new book, um, When Danger is Past. Uh, this is a piece that Anja has has translated into German. German. So I'll read it. I'll read the English first. That's Romanicious Cafe in Berlin behind me. My dear friend, if we had sat together in a Berlin cafe on that black election day in 32, sharing our art, laughing and learning, I know you would have spoken for evil, though the beast and his brown shirts were weaker then than ours are now. Would you still have spoken so in 33 when their mad master so like ours, triumphed, or weeks later when their capital burned, or the next day when their Patriot Act passed, or the next month when their Manzanar opened. What say you now, so like then, just weeks since our president's darlings, the uncolored beasts, swarmed our rice tub. Which of us will pick up your tab this time? And what will it be? When is the end of friendship? Will you speak for the monsters still? Tender yet again, your gaslighting caress to all of us who love you. Okay, I will read the German translation. I hope somebody will understand. <laughs> mein lieber Freund, wenn wir an diesem schwarzen Wahltag im Jahr 32 in einem Berliner Café zusammengesessen hätten, über Kunst geredet, gelacht und voneinander gelernt hätten, ich weiß, du hättest für das Böse gesprochen obwohl das Biest und seine Braunhemden damals schwächer waren als jetzt bei uns. Hättest du im Jahr 33 auch noch so gesprochen, als deren verrückter Tyrann 
dem unseren sogleich triumphierte, oder Wochen später, als ihr Reichstag brannte, oder am Tag, nachdem die Reichstagsbrandverordnung verabschiedet wurde, oder im Monat danach, als Dachau eröffnet wurde. Was sagst du jetzt? So wie damals, nur wenige Wochen, nachdem die Anhänger unserer Präsidenten, die weißen Bestien, unser Kapitol in Massen besetzten. Wer von uns wird dieses Mal die Rechnung zahlen? Und was für eine wird es sein? Wann ist eine Freundschaft zu Ende? Wirst du weiter für die Monster sprechen und uns, die wir dich alle lieben, mit deinen falschen Streicheleien umgarnen? Thank you. <laughs> Very nice poem. Thank you, Ancha. It's one of the proudest things for me when my, my poetry is translated into other languages. On March 3rd, 2022, Katie Meyer, captain of the 2019 national champion Stanford University soccer team, committed suicide in her campus room. Sparrow generations. Brown offered a full ride on my tennis, MIT on academics. Even then I knew I want to learn in college. I have a choice. Chris Dolman, Tony Dorsett, Dan Marino, the lucky athletes who soared to glory. Their generations passed through Pitt Stadium right outside my office window. I marveled as the Coliseum was demolished. And one morning, at early morning at the end, when no one else was looking, the facade with the entrance gate fell. The last grand relic to come down broke the street and the sewer beneath. And I finally understood that choice I made at 16. Now it's an event center the peat, glass and concrete, food mall and Wi-Fi, Judas Priest and basketball, Foo Fighters, hockey, Disney on ice. Sometimes I ride up the escalator. Mostly I walk outdoors through the hedges, alive with birds, feral cats and groundhogs. Either way, you can't miss that vaulted interior, limitless ceiling, video wall like the side of a house, sports news constantly running, pictures of trophied athletes displayed in locked cases like numbered Audubon prints or rare baseball cards. In the morning, I pass by the gym. Even at six, there are students on the treadmills boys fit and massive, beautiful, girls fit and beautiful too. I see them on campus with their teammates, lounging and laughing, bruised and braced, casts and crutches. Often a bird strikes the peat windows in flight, then lies still on the concrete till the janitor comes. Sometimes I carry one back to the hedges when it's been days. Last week, I saw a sparrow by the glass wall standing on the concrete like a statue, even when I knelt beside it. I touched his belly, urged him, step up. He hopped over my finger, then turned and flew onto my hand. The life and quickness in that tiny body, the bright trust of a stranger. I slowly stood and walked him up to the hedges, urged him once more, and he flew free on to his own life. That sparrow generations. I have one more short poem to, to close with. I think this is about the bridges. Our shared humanities. Nothing is deadlier. Dogma. 
so beautiful, courage, riskier, faith, seductive, privilege, more noble and just, war, more profane, indifference, crueler, God, no greater truth, kindness, nor greater lie, color, nothing more human, discovery. That's our shared humanities. Thank you, everyone. Craig, thank you. Our second reader, a New York native, longtime resident of New York, Francine Witt. She obtained her MFA from the University of Vermont and is the author of several volumes of poetry and flash fiction. Very well known now as a flash fiction editor for Poetry Bay, that's my group, our group, Southern, the South Florida Poetry Review, also known as So Flow Po Joe. And um, so it was really instrumental in uh, helping to uh, promote and develop the uh, promotional activities for the New York City anthology, New York City from the, uh, from the inside at the moment. It's a good friend, Francine Witt. Please welcome her. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, George and uh, Don for hosting this. Uh, thank you, George, for asking me and uh, to all the other readers who have uh, read today. It's beautiful, beautiful to be in your company. Uh, I'm going to read about four pieces, and I realize that I don't particularly write about bridges, per se, but I do write a lot about perspective and perspective as a bridge. In other words, uh, understanding that um, other people, you know, have their points of view, and sometimes that's a road to peace. You know, not always, but if, you know, if we can remember that Everybody thinks that they're right. So uh, sometimes if you're having a little disagreement with someone, if you could just say, well, where are they coming from? Uh, it might help that might form a bridge. Um, so this first one's called Woman Bird. Woman walks the bird she caught one day in a weeping tree. The bird now, tried to, now tied to a string above her, not five feet long just long enough to skim the sky. Her pet, she tells her friends, but really she wants the bird to catch the dreams she had that flew away. Bring them to me, the woman says. Lucky, she tells the bird, you have the gift of flight. If it were me, I'd bathe myself all day in the gauze of clouds, fill the air with stretch and song so loud no one would forget I was here. Bird walks the woman he caught one day as he waited in a willow tree, keeps her on a string below him not five feet long, tells his bird friends she is his human. But really, he is safe now from the scavenge of vultures, the zigzags of lightning on a summer night. The bird is held by the gravity of flight always having to skitter at the slightest sound. The clouds not strong enough to rest on. You are lucky, he wants to tell the woman. You have the gift of land. If I had the pull of earth wanting to always keep me, the heft of a foot big enough to leave a print, a hollow, I'd bathe myself all day in the swim of mud, push dirt together enough to start a mountain so high no one would forget I was here. The river's wife. Each night, I ask him if he still loves me. He tells me instead how he started, hands full of rain and mountain streams, how it trickled into a muscled flow. I ask him again, 
and that's when he goes back to hiss and spin. I give up and head home, lonely, cutting my feet on scrags of rocks and fallen twigs. Some nights I wake up, go to the kitchen, turn on the faucet full blast, water fingers lacing my own. My father warned me, said that the river is made up of tears from all the fish that never made it out to sea. He says that he was a river once, a foaming, raging twist of a man who lured my mother from the banks, how she gave up girl-like to his tumble and roar, how I myself am part river, how if I listen close enough, I can hear the whoosh that is louder than the beating of my heart. Uh, just a trigger warning, there's, I'm using the B word in this, but it, yeah, you know, it's for, for the sake of uh, authenticity. <laughs> the day, this is called split. The day is slowing to a shiver now, slowing and blacking into night. And that's when your father comes home, hole in his soul and says things like supper and bitch. And your mother slams back, you're late, you're late. And you, you are standing there not knowing which way to turn. And the anger that was floating like day dust on the sunlight air springs up and gathers and plants itself into that hole in your father's soul, just digs and digs. And your father is bare now, little more than a pair of hands lunging towards your mother who has broken her own self and is saying things like, I don't love you anyway. And if you only knew, if you only knew, and you're watching this being pulled and pulled like your taffy or a jump rope because you're still a kid and you want to go to your happy place, a beautiful beach where at any time you can walk into the ocean, go back to your fish self, the swimming sperm that crossed your mother's insides, that split second that you were about to become you. And the only trembling was coming from love and desire. And if someone were to ask you at that very moment, which of your parents you needed more, you wouldn't have to choose. And the last piece is called definition. The little boy asks his family what a lemon is. The mother, mostly apron, says, oh, I use it in my cooking also to sprinkle on fish. The father who is rumpled like the evening paper says, ha, a, a lemon is the car your mother's brother sold me. The boy's older sister is boy drunk and says she uses lemons to bleach freckles off her face and also to blonde up her hair. The boy then asks his grandmother what a lemon is. She is round-shouldered and pucker-skinned. She only comes downstairs once a day now. Other times, she is in the attic where she lives. A tiny window, a tinier view. She says, the sun is a lemon, sometimes a slice, sometimes a wedge. It fits different each day in the window and each day a little less yellow than it was the day before. Thank you again, everybody, for listening. Francine Wood. Thank you, Francine. Really wonderful reading. Todd Krieger, thank you, Francine Wood. And our third poet from New York City is Karen Newberg with an MFA from the New School. She's a Brooklyn-based poet. She's one of several who, uh, who are part of First Literary Review East who are participating in this series. And we welcome them all, Patricia Carrigan and Karen and uh, Cindy Hochman. She's the author of the full-length collection, Pursuit. And as I say, associate editor of the online poetry journal, First, Letter, First Literary Review East. Please welcome my friend, Karen Newberg. Hi, thank you, George. Uh, I'm really honored to be part of this series. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm honored to be reading with all these wonderful poets. I've, I 
I'm really, I'm speechless about it. It's just going to stay with me a long time. Um, I've thought quite a lot about what to read. So hopefully um, some of it will resonate with you all for who are listening. <clears throat> I'm starting with a poem called Green, which is in um, my collection Pursuit. And it's um, after Jasper John's painting Green Target. <clears throat> Excuse me. Green hears me singing the blues and intervenes. She follows me into my dreams, posing as curtain, as cycle, as movie star. She offers a bottle of herself, mint julep. Smitten I am and swamp haze until I come upon my fear of the snake in her, of the lizard tail she can release and leave dangling in my grasp. Spiraling her concentric swirls around my wrist, I cogitate heartbeat and conception. In retrospect, she remains forever at my childhood side, protean, pliable, and perfectly plausible. When I break away to pursue my other love, blue, she reminds me I can simply add the yoke of sun to summon her return. Now if I can just learn to omit fear from my life, I'll be young again, full of bullseye and whirl a gig. Uh, this, this is a poem that's a bit older. I think it still rings true. It's called Information. And it actually starts with a quote from Gertrude Stein, which I think is from around 1904. Everyone gets so much information all day long that they lose their common sense. I see another spectacle blocking my view, another fad slipping into my bed. The cave walls are filled with conflicting shadows, demanding attention in urgent and dazzling tones. How small respect has become. It fits our eyes like drones, while entertainment pumps up our need to be amused. I feel strings attaching to my heart, tugging me away from what I used to know. I'm diverted by a spin of words that cover over and are covered by. Pack of lies, pack of truths. Information pours and pours, burying us beneath ourselves. This is the title poem from my chapbook, The Elephants Are Asking, which addresses my concerns about the climate crisis. And the title is also the first line of the poem. The elephants are asking, and the bees and the bats, the prairie dogs, the lemurs, the dolphins, one in six species asking. And the coral reefs, the rivers and oceans, the islands and shorelines asking. And the aspen, the redwood, sequoia, the boreal, the rainforests asking and the baby toes wiggling free in spring and summer, and the baby plump arms, fat cheeks, trusting eyes, asking, asking, even God is asking. Whenever possible, I like to include some kind of a love poem. This is called Winter Body in the Bubble of Now. After the calmness claimed or bound loosely, this entire body, no entrance became again enticed by tidal motion. Remembering prior seemed to lead to a past replayed without intensity. But when he took my, offered his hand along the icy path as we walked side by side, what stirred within me was something to sing, was something that would keep expanding and never burst. And like everyone, I've been, uh, no words for it, sad and overwhelmed, horrified by this war, by any war, but now this war. And this is um, a very new poem. It's called, This Poem Doesn't Want to Talk About the War. This poem doesn't want to talk about the war or history rising from its burial place 
or any number of disquiets brought to us daily through the media or firsthand. This poem wants to be a kite flying in wild wind, pulling you by taut string through waves at shore's edge, a barely remembered occurrence that helped make you the you you are. In the mirrored hallway, descending stairs, banister to slide, rush outside, the sun, the wind, the kite, the twine, the waves, the waves, the war, the waves. And I'll end with um, this poem. It's called, Let Me Sing the Garden. Let me sing green and stroll the garden, collect the yellows and purples, bathe in the luxury of butterfly and bee. Let the hummingbirds hum the afternoon light, let the fireflies light the blue hour. Let me sing. Let me sing the garden. Let me be a tree. Let me reach, reach into the song of the seasons. Let the seasons keep their pace steady in promise. Let the promise be a garden. I'm lost in a dream with no garden. I'm lost in a world where green is lost, where creatures are lost, some who we never met or named. Let me sing the garden. Sing the birds, sing the flowers. Let me sit in the crotch of a tree. Let me be a nest. Thank you. Karen Newberg. Beautiful work, Karen. Thank you so much. Amazing poems. Now I'll turn to our final uh, guest from New York and uh, a friend of person I've sat in an audience with and Levon Helm came around to a roadhouse on Long Island to we were drinking in the audience and enjoying Levon's pickup band. And uh, he's been ubiquitous in New York. I've seen him at uh, CBGB's and outdoor fairs and festivals all across the region leading uh, Boston over beatniks as the front man. But I'm not gonna say how many years it is because it's been a lot of years. The very fine musician, Tom Gould. Please welcome Tom. Tom, Pat. Microphone. Microphone's on, please. Pat, here's a star. I think I think Pat's gonna stay muted. Oh. But Tom is also still muted. Are we there? All right, good. We're good to go. I was listening. All right. We are unmuted now, yes? All right. New music from the Boston of the Beatniks. Losing green above the trees, gone to red and gold. Orange orb around the next corner. Lights and ladies, love and lingers with her. On a highway stretching miles and miles into nowhere. A diner stands by a sign saying this is somewhere Little Jane and baby Joe, they work there And everyone cherishes the one 
Child's on the drums. Come in, Pat. When you get weary, times get tough. When you decide it, enough is enough. When you see light, end of the day, you see that light just fading away You can't talk to me my darling darling You can't talk to me Whatever it is Whatever will be You can't talk When you're about taking all you can take, your body's shaking, your body aches. When you feel tears beginning to flow, there's nowhere to run, nowhere to go. You feel so fragile. Girl, I know how that can be You can talk to me You can talk to me My darling, darling You can talk to me Whatever it is Whatever will be can talk to me.
feel so fragile, girl, I know how that can be. You can talk to me. You can talk to me, but darling, darling, you can talk to me. Whatever it is. Whatever will be, you can talk to me. You can talk to me, darling, darling. You can talk to me. Whatever it is, whatever will be. You can talk to me. You can talk to me. Whatever it is, whatever will be, you can talk to me. Thank you. Tom Gold with his drummer, Pat Giles, a dual screen performance, our first in this series. And at 1159 Eastern Standard Time, once again, I want to thank all of you for joining us for day four of six sessions of Poets Building Bridges. Fantastic work, everybody. I want to... Uh, remind you to communicate with each other, get to know each other, build from this, build forward from this in relationships because uh, we're all part of a community though we're separated by thousands of miles we're connected by poetry. And that bridge is what uh, makes uh, so many good things happen. Again, once again, I wanna thank uh, Don Krieger Cultivating Voices for, for making this uh, happen technically. I wanna thank Anja Stain for for her work in bringing together people from Italy and, uh, and Lola Kundakshin for her work in bringing us people from the Armenian diaspora. Next weekend, on the 19th and 20th, we'll have Lucilla Lucilla Crepazzo, who's going to be um, bringing us uh, another group of Italian poets. Mercea, Mercha Danduta from Bucharest, also the Czech Republic and, uh, and, uh, and the Slovak Republic, who's here with us today. He's going to be bringing us a group of people. Then on the 20th, we'll have a finale of a group of poets from Bolton, England, a very fine working class town up in the in northern, north western part of New England, and a, a fine group of Tamil poets from Chennai, South India, Tamil Nadu. So on behalf of all of you, thank you. Thank you in the audience. Thank you out there in Facebook land. This will be um, added to our YouTube series very shortly. And I hope to see you next weekend. On behalf of all of us, to all of you, thank you for joining us. And I'll say adios for now.